My name is Tim Jax. I'm an assistant professor of journalism at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. I make documentary films, and those documentary films, you know, explore a range of topics, but all kind of broadly within, you know, natural history and science and the environment. Before coming to the University of Rhode Island, I was making films, I was out telling visual stories. In coming to URI, I found a, a community that not only values learning, but values the opportunities to go out and, and to make their own work, to actually have experiences in the field. I focus on science and environmental storytelling, so that ranges everything from exploring new scientific research and ideas to telling the stories of the people behind those ideas to situating that those uh, stories of research and kind of cutting edge science happening in place. My focus in science and the environment really came from my desire to be outside to explore the natural world and to use the camera as a means to do that. Throughout the course of my career, the camera for me and the access to those stories has always been a, uh, it's been a passport. It's taken me to amazing places, you know, the jungles of Mexico, uh, the Coral Sea in Indonesia, the base camp of Denali. And when I go to these places, I'm there in search of a story, and the goal is to bring that story home. I hope students take away from a class with me is, is to develop their own sense of agency, is to develop their own sense of authorship when it comes to actually creating whether that be in visual stories or in the written word or in audio, I hope that they use my classes as an opportunity to define their own voice and to take that voice out into the world and to, to really observe the world deeply. What I hope people take away from, from my research really is a, a deep sense of awe and wonder about the natural world, about the planet that we call home. Hi everyone, my name is Karen LaPointe and on behalf of the URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement, I'd like to welcome you to our program this evening. We are very happy to present the second in our spring semester faculty office hour series where we're exploring the theme of sustainability. And today we welcome Jason Jacks, Assistant Professor of Multimedia Journalism in the College of Arts and Sciences. Acting as moderator this evening is Mary Beth Riley McGreen, a writer and editor in URI's Department of Communications and External Relations. If you have questions for Professor Jacks, please post them in the chat section on your screens. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can after the presentation. And just a quick note, today's program will be recorded. In a few days, for those who registered for the event, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording, along with recommended resources for further reading. You'll also be receiving a very brief survey from us and we do welcome your feedback. Now, I'm happy to turn the program over to Mary Beth. Thank you, Karen. Um, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here and so glad that uh, you could join us tonight. I'm honored to introduce Jason Jacks, filmmaker, photographer, multimedia journalist, who is now an assistant professor of multimedia journalism in the Harrington School of Communication and Media within the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, before coming to URI, Professor Jacks spent a decade producing documentary films and making his mark in digital storytelling around the globe. He has worked as a visual journalist and documentary filmmaker for a variety of news organizations, including many that you've heard of before, National Geographic, The New York Times, and PBS among them. Uh, he has produced and directed numerous independent films and digital shorts that have screened internationally at film festivals, on television, and online in major publications and media outlets. This evening, Professor Jax is going to take us through his own award-winning work and he'll discuss how he teaches students at URI to become visual storytellers. Now I'll turn it over to Professor, Professor Jax. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I did wanna start this evening just by uh, giving a little bit of sense uh, as a visual storyteller of the work that I've done. And uh, in that regard, I have a couple of slides that I would like to show. Uh, and to, to kind of bring you the audience along on, on a small journey that gets us kind of from how I think about storytelling to the kind of places that I've been able to do that to really how I bring that into the classroom. But before we begin with that journey, I want to start us off with this quote, uh, a wonderful quote from Robert McFarlane, uh, who's a, just an incredible author. 
And the quote, you know, wonder is an essential skill for the Anthropocene. Uh, you know, from my perspective, that quote really kind of hits me right in the in the center of my gut. You know, it has been a it's been a really challenging week in the news for just so, so many reasons, including what is happening in Eastern Europe and Ukraine currently. But in addition to all of the, the kind of the world news that's happening, we also saw two reports uh, come out in the last week that have have, you know, pretty uh, startling news. Uh, one released from the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, and then another a technical report released from NOAA about uh, sea level rise that will affect us here in the ocean state. And so as we consider our place on the planet, really as we consider our home and how we best, you know, make a make a life on it in change in how it's changing, this quote seems like to me a really incredible place to start from. This idea that this planet that we live on is absolutely awe-inspiring, is incredible, is full of wonder. And that wonder, that sense of awe about the places that we live, both near and far, is an, is an essential skill for how we move forward in this time. So before we get to that idea of how to kind of visualize that, how to take that and move it forward, you know, to kind of understand this journey, you have to understand this, right? Uh, a, a small kid growing up in Colorado who love to spend time outside, who love to be out in the natural world, and who, uh, you know, as clearly demonstrated by this picture, was really into very large sized fish. And so that kind of started a journey for me, that love of being outside, that love of experiencing the natural world, uh, whether, you know, uh, that meant uh, being out canoeing or fishing or being out hiking, being out in these outdoor spaces, that really was foundational for me to begin uh, to form a sense of how I saw the world and, and then would lead to how I would end up trying to document it. And what that ended up turning into was uh, this incredible passport, right? The camera. I turned to the camera at a really young age. I started picking up Legos and shooting birds in the backyard with a video camera uh, when I was about, you know, about a third grader and just fell in love with that process, with that you know, the kind of the the experience that you would have while lugging all of this camera gear around trying to visualize the the kind of the wonder in front of you. And so that from those kind of those beginnings in the outside, you know, kind of charting that over the, the, the course of my career, I've been able to really, you know, use that camera as a passport. And I should mention that the the kind of the the next time that I would see a fish that was comparatively that size up close uh, was actually just this past summer with some spa, uh, some spawning bull trout up in the back country in Montana. And it is hard to tell from this picture, but those adult bull trout are about 40 inches long. And so clearly there was a theme for me to get back out and to really take an audience with me via the camera, to really go out and tell stories, to use the camera again, to bring uh, an audience with me on that journey. And I've been just incredibly lucky in that process. I've been able to travel to far flung pla you know, places all around the globe. I've been able to uh, find stories that have really meant a lot to me, but have also really allowed me this opportunity to kind of see the natural world, to experience it firsthand, and ultimately to come back home with a story. And you know, my goal as a storyteller is to instill in in the viewer, in the in the reader, in the watcher. Um, the same kind of awe that I had when being outside and actually documenting it. And so in addition to actually, you know, using that camera as a passport, I've also been able to do that for a, a number of organizations. And that has been a, a real, um, both challenging, but also a, a real joy to take those stories, to find collaborations, to find partners, to run those stories, and to be able ultimately to spread those images, those videos, those visuals with very, you know, with large and small audiences. And so in that capacity, I've, I've worked for a number of organizations and I'm now kind of starting to bring that into the classroom and have been able to produce, I've also been able to produce a series of, of documentary films that have, again, screened in film festivals uh, across the country and, and really across the world. The most recent of which is actually a collaboration with a student, the, the photograph up here, uh, the poster for Turtles on the Hill is a really uh, powerful film that I had the opportunity to produce 
but that a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island was able to direct and really lead the storytelling on that. And that most recent project, Turtles on the Hill, is actually about to have its world premiere at the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. in a couple of weeks. And so that process of getting out into the world and bringing those stories home, again, whether that's local or whether that's afar, that has continued even since I've arrived at URI. So for me, the the real kind of the the real joy in being a part of this community is to not only to be able to bring those experiences into the classroom, but really to be able to work with students. You know, like I said in the video, but uh, but really to allow students to find their own voice, to find their own capability, and really to go out and experience the world around them. So a lot of the courses that I teach are very experiential, are really based in reporting. So students are getting out, they're getting out into the fields, they're talking to community members, they're talking to experts, they're doing that in a variety of platforms and they're telling their own stories. Uh, most recently, I ran a, a, a kind of an interesting hybrid course between, uh, that included graduate students and undergraduate students. And those are the photographs you see here. We actually were producing uh, a number of video pieces for local partners, which was really cool because it allowed for students to both create and to take kind of ownership over that storytelling, but for real world audiences. So we actually uh, partnered with a number of local organizations. We were able to shoot with Save the Bay, with Rhode Island PBS, with uh, PBS Learning Media, with the Roger Williams Park Zoo, and really kind of come to those organizations with, uh, with a project in mind and to be able to allow students to kind of take those projects and really produce them. We're now in the process of, of finishing editing those, which I'm looking forward to sharing uh, kind of with the URI community a little bit later this semester. But that idea of taking those experiential opportunities, of bringing those stories into the classroom and then you know, using the classroom as a training ground and then sending students off, that's really the kind of the philosophy that I'm bringing uh, to, to the classes that I teach. So, in addition to the, the kind of the coursework that I teach primarily within the journalism department, um, I've also started a, uh, a, a lab at the university that's housed in Harrington called the Science and Story Lab. And that lab really functions as a, uh, a framework to do the kind of collaborations that I was just mentioning about with students. And the idea here is to really take uh, the, the kind of the different communities that we have both at URI and then beyond. So the research community, uh, the student community and both at an undergraduate and a graduate level, and then community partners. Again, I mentioned some of them before, but these are partners who have real world media needs. And the lab then provides us a framework to both have students produce work for real world partners, but then to also be able to help facilitate really compelling character driven, you know, fact driven storytelling about the incredible amount of research that is coming out of this university because it really is astounding the both the depth and the variety of research happening so i primarily focus in the natural sciences but you know uri we're a we're a state we're the flagship state university and the uh, kind of the level of research coming out of this institution is uh, just there's a there's an incredible opportunity to do really compelling storytelling around that. So the lab again provides this framework through which I'm able as a professor then to bring students along this the kind of the storytelling process and to be able to partner with colleagues uh, both kind of near and far at the university and outside of our direct URI community. So really the goal here is to bring uh, bring audiences on a journey, right? To help them feel the same awe, like I mentioned, when I'm out actually taking these photographs. And the one kind of example that I wanted to take that to the, the kind of the next level is uh, with a, a big kind of very interdisciplinary group that's studying microplastics. Microplastics uh, are, are ubiquitous. They are coming from all kinds of different sources, and there is a number, a very large interdisciplinary group of researchers at URI who are really asking really important questions about how we manage our waste and really what kind of action we can take as you know community members, both at URI, but really as, as kind of community members on the planet. How do we think about our waste stream? How do we think about what we consume? And so what has been really uh, interesting and fun and, and kind of challenging for me as a visual storyteller 
now that I'm here at the university is to really consider that sense of awe that I've that I've brought to storytelling, you know, kind of in my life before URI, but really try to situate that in in action, right? Really try to take those um, images and those stories and to turn them into ways that we can move forward, right? Methods that we can move forward uh, with, actual actions that we can take that can make a difference on this very fragile blue marble that we live on. And so with that microplastics project, as an example, uh, this ran as the cover of the URI magazine in fall of 2020, really investigating this plastic problem, really trying to find a way of visualizing that story so that it will invite audiences in, it will stop people in their tracks so that they will wanna know what is on the cover of this magazine. And they will use that as the, the window to go into all of the great reporting in there uh, to really learn about this issue in particular. Um, but then I think there's there's an opportunity to do that with so many of uh, so many stories within science and the environment. So it's a little bit of background about kind of where I'm coming from, uh, my approach to storytelling and how I've brought those approaches into the classroom, which has been a, a, a real joy to work with young people, work with this next generation of storytellers. And I wanted to open it up now because uh, I'm not alone in doing this really, you know, impact driven science communication work. I'm not alone by a long shot. And so to kind of discuss this within the context of, of URI, um, would love to have a, uh, a kind of broader discussion. So with that, maybe we'll bring Mary Beth back. I, I love that. Um, I don't know that I've, I've heard it phrased that way, but impact driven science communication. That's, that's, that's so neatly kind of talking about what, what the goal is beyond the creation of the thing, whether it be an article or a film or whatever, that there's a, there's a strategy and a, and a, an overarching um, goal with, with a piece. And I thought one of the things I think that um, especially um, people who maybe um, are entertaining the thought of taking a, a filmmaking course or really any kind of uh, enterprise that involves making is how do you how do you start these things and how do you find the story i think you know a lot of people go out into the world they find beautiful images but they're they're at a loss for how um how that translates into some kind of more cohesive creation that that has impact yeah, we spend so much time in uh, in our journalism classes really trying to answer that question. How how do you actually go about finding stories? And I think the the first kind of piece of that is a is a deep sense of curiosity. And you know, we all have this as kids, right? We all get to the the ocean as as little kids. You see every time you go out to the coast, you see this, you know, kids pulling up rocks and kind of kicking around and and really investigating their world. And so much of what I think uh, journalists have to do is, is to kind of take that skill that, that I really think, you know, is kind of an innate human skill, that idea of exploration, that idea of curiosity. But it's, it's a little bit like a muscle. You have to build it, right? You have to hone it. You have to sharpen it. You have to think about it in, you know, certainly within whatever beat you're working on, but within the context of the stories that you want to do. So for me, when I'm looking for environmental stories, or stories about science, you know, I'm not only am I looking for the kind of the headlines, right? New cutting edge research discovers X, Y, and Z, but I'm really looking uh, for those stories beyond the headlines. I'm really looking for the stories of the people who go about the science, right? The processes that are happening there, the, the kind of the behind the scenes that give you greater insight, not just into the process of science, but really into the process of how scientists think and how that, how that kind of worldview works. And so I'm, I'm often driven by characters more than, you know, more than a topic, more than a place. I'm really driven to tell stories of, of people because people really are our vehicle into something that, you know, these issues within science and the environment that can be really challenging. Ideas like vaccines, ideas like climate change, ideas like sea level rise. Those are abstract, really hard to understand concepts. But mm -hmm. if you can find people who can you know bring you into a story about those topics? Then that's the uh, that's the kind of that's the the thing we trade in as as journalists. It's finding those sources. It's finding those characters. So for me, it's it's having kind of a long list of 
people who I just I find interesting, who I think their work is really fascinating. And I think that they could potentially be a, a really good story. Mm-hmm. And I, I share that usually with my students as a place to begin thinking about, you know, thinking about it from finding characters and sources. Mm-hmm. Because those issues that you mentioned are are so large as to be kind of demotivating in a way. I'm going to I'm going to do a film about climate change. Um, the, the, how you know how do we, how do we talk about this topic in a way that um, fits within a you know a set time frame that people that people will will sit for. Um, one of the things that I've found I'm curious in in your work. One of the things that I've found you know, as a person who writes, uh, you know, who's, who's dealing in print is when somebody says to me, um, oh, this, this probably isn't even important, or I don't even know why I remember this, that tends to be for me something that I know is going to lead to a major revelation. Mm -hmm. Uh, For whatever reason, people couch it in, in something like this is very small, and it, and it ends up being very big. When do you, you know, in the films that you've done and, and, and maybe, maybe one stands out, how do you know the moment when you've got the start, the lead of the story? Is it, it does it change for you or can you, at this point, are you like, yeah, it, that's it. I'm, I know where I'm going from here on in, or is it more of an iterative process? <laughs> oh no, I wish, I wish it was kind of like, Oh, I found I found the formula and it works. And yeah. now, you know, and here, you know, here it goes. Um, I, I think I think any filmmaker will tell you, you know, the process. And, you know, I, I think reporters who work in long form print, anybody who takes on very large creative projects, I feel like goes through a relatively similar process where at the beginning you're surrounded by questions. You have no answers. And as soon as you start to the to kind of dig in any one direction, you, you end up kind of finding a, a fair number of dead ends. The creative process is not, it's not linear and it's not, uh, it's not always rewarding, right? I think there's a lot of parts of the kind of the, the work that happen over the course of a film where there's, there's kind of a lot of down in the, down in the dumps about it, right? You're, you're really trying to kind of get through um, this particular challenge with it. And, and I don't mean specific challenges in the field, like, you know, like logistical issues. I mean, kind of creatively, it's how does this story, how does, how do the puzzle pieces that I have really fit? So often for me, just because I'm so visual, I, I like to picture how I think the film will start. Um, but if I were to be more um, exacting in writing that those early kind of those early designs down, and compare them with the end on any given project, they would look very different mm-hmm. um, each time. And so it's, it is this process of of kind of just being with the story. And I think that, that that kind of the ability, you know, paired with that curiosity and that kind of sense of, of exploration about our world is you have to at the same time build the ability to to really deeply observe the world and to be in the moment. And, and I, I talk to my students about this frequently. I, that's what I love about being a photographer specifically. And film, there are ways in which film mirror, you know, kind of exemplifies this as well. But as a photographer, there's nothing else that matters other than what is immediately in front of you looking through the lens. You're not, you know, there's not, there's yesterday doesn't matter. Tomorrow doesn't matter. It's what is right there in front of you. And that kind of ability to be present in the moment, that's that's a rare thing in our world. Uh, and so for me, that I really, really enjoy that particular process. And so I, I use that as kind of a way to, um, to start ideating about how a larger narrative will work. But then that kind of narrative, you know, the narrative process, the actual act of putting together a film really ends up being this kind of up and down, winding, meandering path. So I just want to um, allude to the, the magazine cover for a moment, because when I first saw that cover, I thought I was looking at an organism um, because you've got the it almost looks like it has two eyes. And and there's a you know, there's kind of a weird like, oh, you know, that's awfully close to the surface. Is that a thing? And then you look, of course, more closely and you see it's a it's a it's an aggregation of things and none of them, none of them good for for sea life. Um could you talk a little bit about getting that shot? How long it took, and yeah, that shot. Uh, so we kind of came up with this concept, right? So the concept there, and again, so much of this, the the kind of 
the visual work is trying to figure out how to actually take a, a concept and visualize it. And so for that particular cover, what we were thinking about was how do you take this notion of microplastics? Because to be clear, none of the plastics that you see in that on that cover would technically qualify as microplastics, right? We're talking about that's a, those are macroplastics. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, there's kind of a, a challenge with showing a microscopic, you know, piece of plastic, which yeah. they're beautiful, you know, visualizations for, but they become so abstract that they almost have their, they're beautiful in a way. And what we were trying to capture was, was this kind of threat, right? What the, what the actual threat of microplastics are. So we talked about, uh, you know, finding, actually getting out in the water, not trying to do kind of studio mock-up, but actually being out in the natural environment and finding, plastic that would be out floating in space, you know, in, in the ocean, basically. Mm -hmm. So I went out to Narragansett Town Beach, uh, basically, um, for a couple of mornings with uh, an underwater housing and a snorkel and a mask and just kind of like puttered up and down the beach and got a lot of strange looks. But what <laughs> I was hunting for was this kind of, you know, some kind of detritus, some kind of floating thing that would, um, that would help you know, be a little bit of a metaphor for this threat that we face. Because those plastics that are on that cover, you know, very, very likely will break down and will turn into microplastics. But again, we're kind of playing in this gray area there. So the idea was to was to go find it, go find it out in the wild. And I wanted that very iconic, you know, the the towers down in Narragansett. I wanted something recognizable as coastline, something recognizable as, um, you know, two Rhode Islanders. And so I... Um, so I, I spent a lot of time there snorkeling around, basically uh, kind of looking like a fool, which I do tell my students that, you know, certainly photography uh, with all of the, you know, the gear and the bags and all of that. Um, you never you never look that cool when you're actually doing it because you always have, you know, a bunch of stuff hanging off of you. And it's it's always kind of um, a hectic moment when you're out in the field. But that, that's how I found that image. Well, that that actually leads into my next question, which is when when people hear you you've worked for National Geographic or or PBS, there's that you know Nova. Oh, that conjures something, and you think um, you know state of the art equipment and exotic um, surroundings and you know uh, tents and and all kinds of of uh, images images are kind of kind of conjured by what National Geographic and, and NOVA tend to tend to do. And, and the, the filmmaking is always so gorgeous. And I, I thought it might be nice to kind of talk a little bit about, um, about bats and what you um, had to do to get amazing footage in, in, um, in those, in those instances that were, that maybe would, be right in line with, with what people would think you have to do, but, but also maybe surprise people a little bit. Yeah. So in 2018, I produced uh, directed and shot a, a national geographic wild television special uh, about giant carnivorous bats in Southern Mexico. And that um, I think just that phrase giant carnivorous uh, <laughs> bats pretty much summarizes what both the film was about and, and the experience. So that, that was a project in which, there was a lot of sleeping on the ground in the middle of uh, of the kind of the forests of southern Mexico, uh, waiting, you know, until the the late hours of the night, wee hours of the morning, using some very very fancy equipment, uh, you know, infrared cameras uh, with infrared lights, 8K resolution, red cameras that would be able to shoot at very high speeds to be able to slow flight down, uh, really taking all of the the toys that. Sometimes I, I get a little excited about the toys that we get to use. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly at URI, there's, um, there are some toys to be able to take out and, and kind of really play with, um, it, all in the service of, of telling, you know, telling powerful stories. But certainly the, the BATS work that I did for National Geographic uh, really required a lot of, I think, what people assume to be true when you're working for that organization, which is a lot of backcountry adventure, you know, kind of in the in the middle of nowhere. Um, and for that project, you know, the film crew was just myself. I ran my own sound. I, you know, just had we had um, about 15 cases worth of equipment, but it was kind of whenever I would get around to using any one piece of it, because it was it was really on the film side. It was just myself. It was a, a good friend and collaborator of mine. 
who was shooting a magazine story at the time, a photographer named Anand Varma and his assistant. Um, so really, other than the actual science, uh, the scientists that we were working with in the field, um, of which there was a small group, it was, you know, this wasn't something where there was like craft services and catering on set. You know, this was a, a pretty... Um, a pretty bootstrapped operation. And I should say that, that that project actually came from a short film that you saw the, um, I showed in the slides, you saw a, uh, just the poster from In Search of Zots, which is out on the internet. You can, you can Google it and find it. Uh, National Geographic ran it as did the Atlantic. And both of that, that short film kind of turned into a feature. And you could even take it a step back, which I should mention, especially for the, for the URI and the student audience, you know, my relationship with National Geographic has been a very long, it's been a very long road. Uh, I've, I've been involved with that organization for over a decade. And I got really my start as a, um, as at the time, a, a grant program called the Young Explorers Grant. I was, I was in my 20s when I got the first grant from National Geographic. And over time that, you know, that grant and the success of, of that project that I originally pitched for them, um, led to these additional opportunities where I produced news for them. I went out and produced, uh, you know, photo stories for the digital, um, for their website. I ended up producing television for them. So that, that kind of process that didn't happen overnight, certainly. And in addition, it, it really happened because primarily I, I, you know, began my relationship with the geographic, uh, as a grantee of the nonprofit of the National Geographic Society. And that grant program is still, alive and kicking. Uh, and so that, that granting program is for young up and coming, you know, researchers uh, from undergrads all the way through, you know, postdocs and early career people. That's how they define it now, who are looking for, have an idea, have a story and want to get support. And so that, you know, that's an opportunity that I took, you know, many years ago now and have been able to uh, kind of build that into a relationship that has taken me uh, to a number of very crazy very crazy places. Yeah, I thank you because that that how do you break into the field uh, question, of course, is one that 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 everyone is always. I think really at any point in your professional career, even you're trying to find you know new new venues. Um, so with giant carnivorous bats, um, awe and wonder are kind of built in 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 that in that. Um, when dealing with with a subject like that, um, you had you came to Rhode Island by way of California, right? Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about thinking about the overarching topic of all wonder and sustainability. Would you talk to me about what when you arrived in Rhode Island and when you arrived at URI, what of our natural surroundings? Uh, evoked a similar response in you of awe and wonder? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think what's, what is so remarkable about the smallest state in the union is how much coastline there is here. And even, even in a, a pretty highly urbanized coastline, how much kind of wild pockets there are um, out on, you know, out on our 400 plus miles of coastline. There's just some there's this amazing resource in our backyard. And, I, you know, I was just talking to some colleagues earlier this week about really developing kind of a, um, a, a sense of that. Right. A sense of the of the salt of the salt water, a sense of the sea that is in our backyard, because, you know, the coastline is is changing. Right. The, the ocean kind of beyond our shores is changing as well. But these changes are happening kind of right in our, our backyard. And what I find so fascinating about living in, in Rhode Island is that, you know, I can walk out of my house, you know, walk down to the walk down to the coast. It takes me a little while, but I'll get there eventually. And, uh, you know, you can put a, a mask and a snorkel on and stick your head underwater and you are suddenly in a very, very wild place, hmm. you know, beyond the kind of the the I'm going to the beach for the weekend and I'm going to bring a book and it's going to be great or I'm going to enjoy a nice walk. Those are great ways to experience the coastline as well. Don't get me wrong. But what really strikes me is that when you put that mask on and you stick your head underneath there, you you kind of enter this wild space that it, it's really kind of hard sometimes to balance that. Like you pull your head up and you're like, oh, I'm looking at Newport. You know, this is this really, um, you know, it's this 
very well-known town. It's got the, you know, all of these things going on. But as soon as I put my head back under, I'm, you know, seeing in the summertime, I'm seeing striped bass and tatog and I'm seeing sea urchins and I'm seeing all kinds of, you know, really amazing creatures that are just beyond that thin, you know, that thin line of the surface. And for me moving to, you know, this part of the, of the country has really uh, deepened my, you know, um, my respect for, and, and really kind of opened up this new window of, the, the ocean in our backyard and what a treasure that is. And I think Rhode Islanders really do, uh, really do appreciate the ocean, right? We are the ocean state. There is a, a deep sense of kind of our, our relationship with the ocean in the culture here. And so it's been, it's been really interesting to kind of discover that, to peel back the layers of that. Um, and then couple that with my own, you know, uh, like desire to be able to, to see wild, you know, wild creatures and wild spaces. And I don't have to travel to the Serengeti to see that necessarily. I, I can, but as soon as you kind of get under the water, then you see this world that is, you know, and in some cases is being, you know, met with challenges, but in other cases, right out our backyard is thriving. I mean, Narragansett Bay really is the crown jewel of this state. And to to spend time, not just, you know, not just near it, not just at the shore, but but on it or ideally in it, right, is is a real, I think there's a real opportunity there to deepen our own relationship with the ocean in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And when you're, you're um, talking to an earnest student who say, says, I, I want to do something on climate change. Um, and they're really early into their projects. Um, you mentioned earlier that characters that you really, you're really looking to do character driven stories mm -hmm. um, in your own life. And, I, uh, and in terms of the advice that you give your students, are you doing a lot of that kind of beat work that a, a, a reporter would have done back in the day where you're going down to Galilee or you're, or you're visiting Jamestown and walking spaces or you're going to GSO and just seeing who might be out and about? Does that factor into your kind of connection network that you're, you're trying to build? Yeah, absolutely. And and certainly within the, you know, within URI, the science and story lab, kind of thinking of that really not as some kind of fancy thing, but really just thinking about that as a framework, right? A, a, a space, um, not even a physical space, but just a, a way of beginning those collaborations. I mean, the, the kind of the irony to me is that previous in my kind of previous life as a journalist, I, you know, those sources at a research university were hard fought and were really valued. And mm -hmm. now, you know, I feel so, so lucky to be, I have the same, you know, end of a, of an email address, which means that I have access now to researchers yeah. who are doing just incredible work. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't have to kind of come at them as a, as a journalist necessarily saying, here's the story idea, but as a, as a colleague. So I've been able to collaborate with uh, faculty in cells and at GSO who are, you know, I'm a, I'm a co-PI on National Science Foundation grants to help do that kind of scientific storytelling because there's there's value for uh, you know for that in the project. Um, so I've been able to kind of make those relationships on you know on both the main campus and, and the Bay campus as well. But more more broadly in Rhode Island, I mean I think what's one of the assets um, in this state is the fact that it's so small and that you know the connections here run so deep. That's um, you know every, everybody kind of knows everybody. Which means that that kind of beat work, um, good and out, actually putting, you know, going down to, you know, Galilee or to Newport Harbor to talk to the lobster fishermen or out towards, um, you know, out towards Tiverton and Sakonet Point to see the, you know, what's left of the fleet out there to really get on the ground um, is, is that's, that's the fun part for me, right? That's the fun part of the job is to go talk to people. And I do tell my journalism students, you know, if, um, this is a hard line of work for, for an introvert, right? Um, <laughs> it's totally possible. Um, uh, but it's, you know, I think the, the fun part, um, and the, the kind of the, the constant challenge is to, is to meet people and the, and, you know, go out to make those relationships, make those connections. And that's where those stories, you know, start to bubble up in, in Rhode Island. It seems to be, somebody has a guy for something, right? There's like a, there's a guy for that, right? There's so it's just, <laughs> you know, uh, that's the like the language that I hear all the time when, oh, I got a guy who does that. So, you know, it's uh, it's like finding who, out who that person is and then, you know, talking to them, seeing what stories they, you know, they kind of have. Mm -hmm. 
Taking a different kind of tact on talking about sustainability for a moment, I, one of the early conversations that we've had was about um, when the pandemic first started, you had a group of students who were working on the microplastics project. So they were going to be making, if I have it, if I my recall is correct, they were making films that were that PBS, Rhode Island PBS had an interest in and you were you were giving them that real world experience of actually working with an established media outlet and they were they were doing their work and then the pandemic hit and you had them pivot to do I believe their final projects could be about how the pandemic affected um, their lives, their, you know, uh, or their environment. And I remember seeing some of these where one student decided to film, you know, the quad and just and just really film the silence. And I remember you saying at the time um, that you really were concerned about students, you know, that they had in their hands. And, and what I mean by that is that in, in having their phones, they could do much of what they needed to do to meet the requirements of your class. And I, I, I was so taken with that. I just maybe would love to hear you a little bit about how you um, you're not looking for students to go out and, uh, you know, buy or or create in a way that is going to be um, cost prohibitive. You teach from a position of looking at what they have and 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 starting them there. So I just I just would love to hear about how you kind of arrived at that philosophy mm -hmm. as a as a as a professor. Yeah, I, I mean, look, toys are toys are great. Toys are super fun. I, you know, being able to shoot with all of these high expensive camera gear is really great. But, you know, the, be the best camera is the one that you have with you. Mm -hmm. And every time I tell my students that I always ask a follow up question, how many people left their phone at their house? And <laughs> a hand never goes up, right? Mm -hmm. They always have their phones with them. And what is amazing about this tool? I mean, we live in a time now where we have both an incredible tool for consuming media, but we have an incredibly powerful camera, audio device, a typewriter, a, a still camera, a video camera, all of those things fit in our pocket now. And even, even kind of with the stock applications that come with a, a, a mobile device, you have access to be both a, you know, a consumer of, of media, but also a creator and author of media. And so taking that tool, and, and we see this now, I, I think we've seen there, there's a power and there's also kind of a shadow side to that. But, you know, focusing for a moment on the power of that, we're seeing this now in terms of images coming out of, of, of you know, real live news situation like what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, we are all carrying around multimedia storytelling tools with us that with, um, you know, with the kind of the right sense of direction, we figure out how to discover our own voice, how to discover how to be authors in that space. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, right, we had a class that that needed to pivot and that we weren't going to necessarily be able to access all of the toys. And so the the kind of the nature of the reporting changed, uh, not only to to reflect what was happening, which is why I love teaching journalism, right? There's a, a line at the bottom of every syllabus that says, uh, you know, this is simply a roadmap, which we may uh, leave for a more scenic route at any given time. And we can respond to what's happening in the news with that. And so with the pandemic, the idea was to early on in 2020, the idea was to get students out into the field with devices that they have and to really concentrate then again, not on the tech and the tools and the toys, but to really focus on what they had to say, on what they were experiencing, on what they saw and heard and could observe around them and to capture those in a way that was still beautiful and still elegant, even without shooting it in 8K resolution on a very fancy camera, uh, you know, just shooting it, those really kind of important and interesting and intimate moments, horizontally, not vertically is what my preference was, but horizontally, right on their phones, that, that gave them access to continue to do that, that kind of reporting. So I, I do think, you know, the, the tools uh, of journalism are changing uh, it seems like on a weekly on a weekly basis, frankly. I mean, they're just changing so quickly, and we should be adapting to those tools and figuring out again how to use those tools to best serve the story. Some stories, you know, you really want to have all of those toys to go produce, but uh, that's not that's not a prerequisite for being able to make really to be able to make compelling images and to tell compelling stories. Mm -hmm. 
And um, in that same conversation that we had a while ago, we talked about the fact that you really are interested at the, that the course culminate in a student skill set being pretty broad, um, that they are, that, that they're, that they're familiar with not just filming, but also with, you know, creating a script, creating a story arc, um, uh, having them work with community partners, which, which of course is, 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 is giving them exposure to a, a degree of professionalism that if they didn't have those community part, um, you might, yeah, community partners, um, that maybe, you know, wouldn't come till first job where they, where they're learning how to interact. And, um, I'm just wondering, was that, was that, does that mirror your own education? Um, were you doing that kind of work or is this community partnership work something that you've seen as a necessary complement to maybe some of the more traditional things that you're taught in a course? Yeah, I, that, that very much was my own educational background was kind of experiencing um, very kind of experiential learning based. I mean, I, you know, I, I went to a community college uh, before transferring into a, to a four year institution uh, because I was working at a television station at the time. And so it's just that it that kind of that path was a little bit off, you know, a little bit off the beaten path. And for me, you know, that kind of real experiential education was really powerful. And so I, I try to bring the that same kind of philosophy of, of really letting the work lead. Um, and journalism is an easy field to do that. And we in the journalism department, you know, the, the journalism department at, at URI is, is small but mighty. There are, you know, there are a number of faculty members uh, in our department who really are, are really incredible practice journalists who really think deeply about how best to equip their students with, you know, a foundation with this foundational skill set, right? How to write, how to communicate clearly, how to think about narrative and story, how to do that ethically, how to do that uh, and, and really adhere to the facts, how to have a set of ethics when being out in the world and reporting. And so it's, it's wonderful to kind of think about those things with, um, think about those approaches with, with my colleagues in the department, because I think really uh, is, uh, a really experiential approach into the classroom, because there's just no other way to do the work. You know, you can't really teach journalism in a vacuum. It has to be, students have to be getting out and talking to people. They have to be out, you know, writing stories, reporting stories in sound, in pictures, in video. And so the better we can train them, you know, to have uh, to be conversant in those different technical languages, they don't necessarily need to leave here with a full fluency in in, you know, every part of video production, but to be conversant in these different technologies and really to understand how to do the storytelling. That's um, that's the kind of the approach that that I and my colleagues are bringing into the classroom. Mm -hmm. How in your um, this could be a question in your teaching and your your work that you're doing independently, but how do you, when you are working from a position of awe and wonder and thinking about sustainability, um, how are you choosing, you have a limited amount of time, how are you choosing where to put your efforts um, when there are so many um, equally compelling areas to work in within you know, uh, nature, science. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of narrowing that down is, is, is always really challenging. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's certainly half of my, half of my brain that's more of the, the kind of the beat reporter who, you know, um, I think as a, as a journalist, you develop like an attenuation to interesting stories. And there's part of me that's like a little bit of a, you know, it's like a dog with a tennis ball, right? There's like, Oh man, that's just, you know, regardless of what of what the outcome necessarily is, that's a really good story. And so that fascinates me. Um, and then you have to kind of gut check that with the other half of, of my brain, which is like, yes, uh, but there are there are kind of a series. There's a theme to the stories that I'm really I'm really interested in. And those so stories, certainly since I've you know moved here um, to Rhode Island, have really, uh, really started to kind of dive into coastal resiliency, these stories of coastal mm -hmm resiliency um you see that in the in the turtles on the hill with uh, working with uh terrapin turtles in barrington um again with a with a wonderful master's student recently graduated named carolyn decker 
Uh, you see that now in some of the kind of the newer projects that I'm starting to kind of take underway, really trying to figure and answer this question, you know, how do we live on the coast that is changing, right? How do we kind of uh, continue to be here in a, in a way that is, is going to allow us to adapt? Um, so I'm starting to see kind of themes emerge. And I think uh, as I've as I've progressed in my career, I think what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do now is to kind of recognize that focus and then gravitate more specifically towards it. Because for a long time in my career, you know, I would get a I would get a call saying, "Hello, can you be in Indonesia uh, for three weeks in ten wow. days?" And I would say, "Yeah, let me just get. I got a couple things I got to get, and I will, you know, give me the details." And that was how that, that honestly, that's how a lot of freelance journalists operate. Mm -hmm. uh, they're mm -hmm. kind of moving from place to place. And so the university has allowed me to kind of step back a little bit and to focus on really the, you know, this this notion of coastal resiliency. And then, uh, you know, as 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 I showed in the, the photographs that I put up um, just at the beginning here, I'm still very interested in kind of freshwater uh, in freshwater issues, um, primarily throughout the West. And so I'm, I'm continuing to explore stories in that under that kind of thematic umbrella as well. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about the science and, and story lab uh, concept. Um, and I was looking at, at the um, the three images that you had and then the, the uh, representing researchers, students and, and community partners. Um, how um, I, I, I don't know where you are in the you know, in the planning of that just yet. But, you know, if you had unlimited resources, um, you know, what what are the stories you would most want to be telling? Are they resiliency and and in other areas? If you could, you know, wave a magic wand. Right, right. I certainly certainly the resiliency stories are ones that are very kind of personally motivating for me. And there is a lot of really incredible resiliency work happening, research happening at the university uh, that allows for those collaborations with researchers. Uh, you know, I think the again, the uh, it's not so much if I re if I had a magic wand, it wouldn't be so much to pursue a specific line of stories, but it would be to help kind of facilitate these conversations, these early collaborations really between storytellers and communicators and the research community. And the real, the kind of the inspiration for that, the real kind of the need that I see, not just at the, at, at URI, but kind of much, you know, kind of in a much larger context within our society is that, you know, overall people kind of generally trust scientists, but science, the kind of, uh, you know, capital S science has lost some of its cachet. And part of that is because, you know, the, the stories around science, right? There's this sense that, you know, uh, science is somewhat opaque, right? That science is, is kind of too complicated. There's all of these things happening for it, that how those stories are translated to the, the general public really, really matters. I mean, clearly we have lived through a pandemic in which the value of science communication has never been more clear. And so really thinking through the kind of, you know, I, I, there are so many colleagues uh, of, of mine at the University of Rhode Island who are experts in science communication. And, and we are so blessed to have a, an organization like the Metcalf Institute, you know, housed right on campus. That's a that's a really incredible asset uh, for for the university and for the research community. And so the kind of the angle that I'm looking at it and what I want to use the story, uh, the science and story lab to kind of help facilitate a, a, a slightly more specific conversation towards is what are the, you know, not just the communication needs, um, but how does the storytelling kind of inform those communication needs and how can we have those conversations early and often so that the story, not just about the results of the science, but the, the process as well, can, can be shared with a variety of audiences, right? K through 12 education audiences, with local stakeholder groups, with local governments, with, you know, state and national government, how, you know, kind of parts, you know, parsing out all of those different audiences and uh, figuring out the best stories to tell those audiences. If I had a magic wand to kind of, you know, sh uh, point at the Science and Story Lab, it would be to formalize that process, right? To really start those collaborations early, early and often. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a terrible thing and ask you a, a, a predict the future question, which are the worst. But um, you mentioned early on uh, that um, uh, technology is changing at, at, a, at a rapid pace. 
And um, of course that affects digital storytelling. Um, how are you and your colleagues um, in, in film and journalism in the Harrington School, how are you, um, what's your philosophy on, on, on training a student to be as nimble as they can be um, if they choose to enter a field that has rapid fire change happening all the time? That's a, that's a really great question. And, you know, I, um, ooh, I, I wouldn't dare speak for the Harrington School as a whole, um, <laughs> or even the two departments that I, that I happen to be uh, a member of journalism and, and film media. I mean, certainly, um, that, that's a very, you know, that's a, that's a, um, it's an important question. And I think that question requires a lot of perspectives. It's certainly if you're talking about kind of charting policy, um, but the, the, or, you know, charting curriculum as well. From my perspective though, you know, I, I think technology, uh, the technology is, is always, is always changing. And so the kind of the, there's two approaches that I bring to that, um, that, you know, m may be shared, but again, I, I would speak for myself in this. Um, one is that the foundations of storytelling don't change, right? The foundations of finding compelling characters, of finding conflict that drives, you know, those characters towards a goal, finding stories that have, you know, either capital R or lowercase r resolutions, like those skills are really important. The ability to write well, the, the ability to communicate clearly, to be able to think through a narrative arc, those kind of skills don't really change. The, the ability to work in groups, in collaboration, right? The ability to work with partners, those kind of softer skills don't change. The harder technical skills, like how to function in this software, how to use this, you know, this piece of gear, this camera equipment, this, you know, this particular thing, uh, those those are important. But really, it's important to understand what is common about those skills, uh, mm -hmm. what is common about that technology, and then how to adapt it. So, really, if there were two kind of there were two end goals for me, it would be really having uh, having students understand that foundational skill set and building those foundational skills and then teaching them the teaching them the ability to adapt because that ability to adapt allows you know as as many of my colleagues can say um you know we look here than what is available now and that is going to be true moving forward. What has allowed us each, you know, individually to adapt to new technology has been this, you know, this base set of skills and then this kind of flexibility to say, okay, this is how it worked with this camera. What knowledge can I take from that and apply to this? And then how many YouTube tutorials am I going to really need to watch to get caught up on it, right? And we, we do have access to that now. Uh, and so that's, that's uh, that ability to adapt and, and teach yourself, I think, is one of kind of the better skills that we can uh, leave that students can leave, you know, the Harrington school with. Mm -hmm. So I think we have just a couple more moments, but impact driven science communication. If, if your sense of awe and wonder um, prompts you to want to act, um, what, you know, what can the average, and, and I'm thinking about the, the alumni in the audience tonight too, what, what, what can we do um, uh, you know, in, in terms of these, you know, wicked in the scientific sense problems that we might, you know, might want to um, at least approach incrementally in, 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 in yeah, you know, in, from the space where we are with the resources that we have. Yeah, I think to bring it back to to that notion of sustainability and uh, and then really kind of pairing that with impact driven science communication, an image for me or a film that is most successful is is the one that really uh, drives someone to to act right and and that can be done in such small ways. I mean, the the most recent film I did, this Turtles on the Hill, is really a celebration of a thirty years long conservation project led by local volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so that notion of and this is nobody's getting paid to do this work. Nobody they just there's a group of people in Barrington who love these turtles so much that they come back year after year uh, to to keep up the not only, you know, the this kind of population, but to collect data around that and that kind of citizen science, that citizen participation. I mean, that's that's the headline here. And if I can tell stories that 
inspire people to participate, even in small, even in small ways, small ways at scale uh, can really lead to, to big change. And I think that we have to kind of, um, we have to take ownership of that. So even if there's some small piece of it, you know, beach cleanups, forgiving, you know, no longer using plastic straws, there's any number of ways to get involved, but kind of picking something that you're passionate about and committing, that's what I would hope impact, you know, driven science communication leads you towards. Here's this information, here's what you can do with it, and and hopefully you're inspired to take part. Well, um, thank you, Professor Jax. Um, you know, as mentioned, within the next few days, um, the, the those um, who are attending tonight will receive a recording, um, a link rather to today's recording, um, and a few other uh, recommendations around further reading and listening that they can do. Um, and um, I I just want to say, um, as as a fan, that. Uh, the having the opportunity tonight to hear about the exciting work that you're doing both out out in the world and also and also on the URI campus and um, um, the contributions that you're making to digital storytelling both as a both as a practitioner and as a faculty member are are deeply appreciated. Um, I, uh, I'm also to make a uh, mention that a faculty office hour will be back on on April 6, featuring John Taylor, assistant professor of plant sciences and entomology. Um, so bugs, that's always <laughs> that's oh, always cool. fun. yeah. yeah. Um, but but thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, it has it has been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for for the invitation, and it's it's so great uh, to find kind of an, another audience uh, within the URI community to be able to to share some ideas and to be able to talk with. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you. <laughs>